So here we have a Liriodendron tulipifera. It's in the Magnoliaceae family, the Magnolia family. You can see it has these uh, big symmetrical leaves that are uh, sort of gently lobed. They can have six to four lobes. Here we have kind of a six lobed one. Here's one with uh, more like four lobes. Um, one way that I've heard to remember it is that the leaves kind of look like a cat face. There's like whiskers coming out the side and ears here. Um, that can start making you think like cat, Leo, Lirio. That was something that one of my old uh, field assistants used to remember it. Um, but they have really cool flowers too. Uh, at least I think they have really cool flowers. It's part of where the name tulip tree comes from is the flowers look a lot like a tulip bloom. Um, you can sort of see how that resembles that with the tepals here. You can see they have the mini stamens, characteristic of that Magnolia C family we saw. So we just saw the flower. Here you can see the immature flower that's about to break open to a, this is a bud that's about to open into a bloom. And here you can see last year's. Um, so this one's already lost most of its seeds. These wing structures here are the individual seeds. So these would be Samaras, they have that winged structure. Um, there's a seed at the bottom and this whole thing would be the fruit. So it comes from one flower, so this would be considered an aggregate fruit. There you go. And here if you look at the stem, you, see, you can see the way the leaves are arranged. This would be an alternate arrangement. Again, characteristic of the Magnolia ACE family. So one last point I want to make about the Liriodendron, the tulip poplar. Um, so this is a big tree. It's one of the largest trees that grow native in this area. They are native to the southeast. This is personally one of my very favorite trees. Um, and like I said, one of the largest trees in this area. They can get over 100 feet tall. Um, they're rather fast growing. They're, they're often kind of an earlier successional species. You often don't see them in a really old forest um, because they kind of shoot up being you know, like really big trees. Um, but then their, their seedlings don't do so very well in like a dense canopy. So like I said, they're generally kind of an early successional species. But really big, massive tree. I think they're so cool. So this is Prunus serotina. So this is a prunus in the family Rosaceae. So one of the first characteristics we're going to talk about is its bark. So the bark on this plant is really smooth, but it has these kind of horizontal stripe looking things. And those are lenticels. So lenticels, you can think of them as essentially pores for the bark uh, that allow for the plant to transpire. So as this matures, the bark will kind of peel off Kind of like burnt corn chips apparently or so i'm told uh i've never heard that metaphor prior to today but apparently the old mature specimens had that trait um so as you go up this tree we're not going to pan up because it's, it's kind of trapped in with a couple other ones but what i am going to do is show you a branch here just got a bee in my face um so the leaves are alternate and they're simple with serrate margins so you can see the alternate like that. And then these are the inflorescences. So the inflorescences are a raceme made up of multiple fruit or multiple flowers, sorry, in this case fruit. Uh, so we are past the point of blooming now, um, but because this is in Rosaceae, they have a hypanthium. And the hypanthium is this enlarged receptacle, right? That's attached to this fruit that contains the seeds. Um, Really cool thing about Prunus serotina or black cherry uh, is that if you scratch off the very surface of newer growth and you smell it, it smells like really sour cherries. And in particular, um, Prunus serotina, uh, that's actually a cyanide derivative compound. So it's not going to kill you. It's not cyanide, but it is derived from cyanide that the plant produces as a way to protect itself. So here we are in front of a big hedge. This shrub here is next to what we're talking about. This is Lanocera macchiae. It's a type of honeysuckle. This is a myrrh honeysuckle. It's different than the Japanese honeysuckle that you may have enjoyed the nectar as a kid, the twining vine. This is a shrub. Both of those are really invasive though. So it has the opposite leaves, um, entire margin, no lobes, uh, no serrations. And these have uh, white or yellow flowers. Um, they come in pairs uh, and they are bilaterally symmetrical. So this tree here is the next one we're going to be looking at. <clears throat> this is an Olmus Americana. This is an American elm. Um, you may have heard of these. These were attacked by a disease uh, a few decades ago, Dutch elm disease. It really wiped them out. 
Uh, but there are some resistant varieties like this one that have been introduced recently. They're starting to help uh, American elms come back, but they used to be quite dominant and they're no longer that way anymore, unfortunately. But we're able to bring some of them back. So you can see the foliage. Um, so one way you can uh, characterize elms is they typically have this oblique leaf base that we talked about earlier in the semester, meaning it has this asymmetrical leaf base. You can see here, see here one side of the leaf is at a different height than the other side of the leaf. So that's one thing that really indicates it being an elm, but it's not exclusive to this, uh, to this family. Um, they have the serrated margin, and like so many things we'll see today, they have a alternate arrangement. You can see leaf here, leaf here, leaf here, leaf here. So alternate arrangement, not opposite. Yeah, American elm. Kind of got a vase-shaped structure. You know, usually branches kind of go up. Anyways, yeah, this is another fun native plant for the landscape. So this, this tree right here, above me, this is the next plant we're going to be talking about. Uh, it's in the genus Nyssa. This is a Nyssa sylvatica. It has the common name Black Tupelo. Um, although it also sometimes goes by the common name Black Gum. And here you can actually see the inflorescences on it, which is really cool. I've never seen this myself. Uh, these are not quite open. These are still just the immature buds. But I still think it's really cool to see the inflorescence on this plant. But, so like so many things we've seen today, this has alternate arrangement. As you can see here where the new growth is coming out in an alternate pattern. And it's got simple leaves with a smooth margin. No lobes. And this is another plant that I like a lot. I think it's underutilized in the landscape. It's a native. It has really spectacular fall color. They generally like wetter areas. You often find them growing naturally in kind of like low areas. Not this specific species, but there's another species in this genus that often grows in really swampy areas alongside things like uh, bald cypress. Um, but yeah, another great native plant. Okay, so this is Circus canadensis, also known as Eastern Redbud. So this is in the Fabaceae family, uh, and this happens to be the study species of my doctoral dissertation. Um, it is characterized by having alternate chordate leaves. So you can see the alternate leaves as they come off one at a time. Um, the leaves are chordately shaped, meaning they're shaped like hearts. There's a lot of cultivar names that have been produced like Ace of Hearts and Heart, Hearts of Gold and all sorts of fun heart themed names that have been given to some of these selections. Um, so we're catching it after blooming and it is starting to produce fruit. So you can see on this branch, these bean-like structures. Remember I said this is in Fabaceae, so these legumes have sutures on two sides that split open and release the speed, the seeds, not the speeds. Um, but yeah, it's a really pretty tree. It's got great foliage uh, and it's very pretty, pretty prevalent in the landscape. So this plant here behind me is uh, the next plant we're going to be covering. Um, this is another native plant. Uh, it can be sort of a medium-sized shrub, uh, sort of like a small tree kind of blurs the line between the two. Um, it has the common name Southern Wax Myrtle. Uh, its scientific name actually changed in the last few years. Um, some of you might have learned it as its old name, uh, Mirica or Marissa serifera, um, but the current name is Morella serifera. So it's moved to the genus Morella. So we get Morella serifera nowadays. So this Southern Wax Myrtle, um, it's a plant that has seven male and female plants. So here you can see the female reproductive structures, the fruits. Um, and while we're moving over to the male plant, I'll let you know this plant got its common name, uh, wax myrtle, because it has really waxy leaves that uh, are so waxy, they actually used to be used to make candles. Um, but here you can see an example of the male inflorescences. But so this is another plant I wish I was on the landscape more. It's native, it's evergreen. It's kind of got thick shrubby growth that's really great for birds. Um, and other things to live in the in the shrubbage to provide cover and the fruit on it are also good for wildlife. So here we have an oak from the Quercus genus. So this oak has gigantic acorns, really big fruit, which gives it its uh, scientific, scientific name, Quercus macrocarpa. You know, oak with big fruit, macrocarpa. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any of the acorns on it currently, but here you can see some of the male catkins. Oh man, there's still pollen coming off it. I don't know if you can see it in the video, but I can see tufts of pollen coming off it. But so there's the male catkins. And you can see the young immature leaves. It's uh, pinnately lobed with rounded lobes. And these leaves will get quite a bit larger as they mature. 
But you can see how they have an alternate arrangement as we learned about being in the uh, oak genus. You can tell that especially by these bud scars or these leaf scars where the leaves fell off from previous year's growth. The newer growth is often tufted at the tips like this and it can be a little difficult to tell the leaf arrangement. So if you look at the scarring on the branches, it becomes a little more apparent. So here you can see some new growth that has an elongated twig where you can see the arrangement a little more clearly. And so this, this specific species of oak is native to North America, but it's definitely not a very common species. You generally find it further north than you do here, uh, but it's not as common as some of the other ones we'll see. All right, so this is one of my absolute favorite plants, Magnolia macrophylla. So this is in Magnolia ACE, also known as the big leaf magnolia. I imagine you can see why already, but just in case, uh, I'm gonna pull a branch down just to show you guys. So, this is the big leaf magnolia. Absolutely massive. This is a flower bud, so this will be open probably in a few days. Uh, so, for those of you that may be joining us on the tour, hopefully you can catch this in bloom. But Magnolia macrophylla, the big leaf magnolia, we talked about mac macrocarpa on the Quercus macrocarpa before, so the big fruited oak, right? Uh, so phylo means leaf, so macrophylla means big leaf. Pretty impressive and very umbrella-like. Um, I've also heard this called the umbrella magnolia before. Um, but yeah, so you can see these large solitary terminal flowers. And remember, these are si single solitary flowers, not an inflorescence with multiple flowers. Um, the leaves have these really nice, pretty straightforward, acute leaf tip. And then the leaf base is a classic auriculate base, um, where it's kind of blown like that, right? Some people might consider this truncate, but I would consider it more auriculate because it has that rounded lobing that goes back beneath where it attaches to the petiole. Almost like a mousier looking structure. Exactly. And that's, uh, that's it, my favorite, Magnolia macrophylla. So this big tree here, above my head, massive tree. This is the next plant we're going to be talking about. Here we have another oak, another plant, the Quercus genus. Um, this is a Quercus nigra, or Quercus nigra. It's, uh, the common name is a water oak. Uh, this is a really common weedy one in this area. It really is pretty weedy. They're really prolific. People kind of don't like them. They suck up a huge amount of water. Um, oftentimes we'll see sort of a dead area around them if you see them in the landscape. Like the other oaks we talked about, they have an alternate arrangement. Um, sometimes it can be really congested and really close, but you can see the alternate arrangement there. And I'm kind of excited. You can see little female flowers there too. They're gonna to become the acorns that we know are associated with oaks. Uh, and so the way that I generally identify the, the species, the leaves um, are generally what I refer to or think of as a spatulate shape, where it's kind of narrow at the bottom and it widens at the top. Um, a lot of times the uh, leaves in this family sort of have, a, I think of them as being like a three finger sort of um, shape, or like I said, narrow at the bottom and sort of a little bit, not quite a low, but a little mini low here, a little mini structure there, and a little, a little low over here. That's how you often see the Quercus nigra water oak leaves. So yeah, got the little specialty leaves, alternate arrangement, acorns, that's Quercus nigra. This tree here, this is the uh, next plant we're gonna be talking about. This is an American beech. It's how your name is Vegas grandifolia. Uh, this is another common plant. You can find our forest around here, um, especially kind of in wetter, uh, more lowland kind of floodplain areas. These these things can get quite massive. Like they can get like a meter across. They have this really smooth gray bark. Um, I always think of it as kind of like a concrete, like sewage pipe, just kind of jutting straight out of the ground. Unfortunately, because of that, you often see them carved up when they're in gardens because they make for a great surface to carve upon. You know, carve people's names in them. Um, but it's a really beautiful, incredibly smooth bark. That is, honestly, for me, the bark is the key ID feature. The bark of this plant really gives it away. But if you're looking at things other than the bark, they have an alternate leaf arrangement. And I apologize, this specimen is kind of torn up from the insects. But you can see they have an alternate arrangement. Leaf here, leaf here, leaf here. They have these broad, unlobed leaves. These are all kind of chewed up. They have uh, little serrations around the outside of it. Um, they have pennate venation, but the, uh, the secondary veins are very parallel. 
and they have a uh, little bit of hairs on them. Uh, they're mildly fuzzy. And here you can see an example of uh, the remnants of last year's uh, seeds, uh, the remnants of last year's fruit. Um, so this technically isn't the uh, Fagaceae family we talked about. So this is not part of the fruit. This is the involucre, and then the nut would have come out of here. Um, but there you can see an example of the structure known as a beech nut. So this tree here, this next plant we're going to be talking about, it's in the genus Carpinus. This is a Carpinus caroliniana. Um, it has some funny common names like American hornbeam. Uh, the common name that I generally refer to it as is musclewood. And that's because, um, for me, one of the main ways to distinguish it is the, uh, the trunk or the bark. Um, so the trunk on this one has these sort of ripples that kind of look like a, you know, a cartoony depiction of a muscle, like a bulging muscle that's, you know, it's got ripples. <laughs> um, so this is another plant that has an alternate arrangement. It has unlobed leaves that have, uh, serrations on them. Um, in just a second, we'll show you, uh, a shot of some inflorescences of the flowers on them. Um, so this hanging down structure here, this is actually the inflorescence. I think it's really interesting. It's a little bit like a hops, but here you can see, uh, the inflorescence hanging down and here looking at the stem, you can see it's got the alternate arrangement, unlobed leaves with a serrated margin. So if you were to be looking at this plant and a Vegas grandifolia or a beech. The main way I would tell them apart would be with the bark. The beech has that really smooth gray trunk, whereas uh, the carpinus, the muscle wood, has that sort of rippling, irregular trunk. Additionally, carpinus carolini caroliniana leaves are doubly serrate. So you can see there's like larger sets of teeth combined with the smaller sets of teeth. As opposed to the beech, which has just a single set of teeth. So this tree here is the uh, next plant we're going to be talking about. This is uh, another oak. Uh, this is Quercus virginiana. This is another one that's native, but you might not find it commonly in this area. You'll generally find it more, a little further south, a little more on the coast. Not necessarily further south. You'd also find it in the Carolinas. Closer to the coast is more so what I should have said. Um, but anyways, this is a live oak, Quercus virginiana. Um, so they have uh, unlobed leaves with a smooth margin, no lobes, in contrast to a lot of the other oaks we see. But one thing that really gives them away, and you can't tell this from the video very well, leaves have that revolute margin that we talked about. Um, if you feel it, the way I'm feeling it on, with my finger right now, I can really clearly feel the curled over leaf edge, um, the revolute margin that's sort of you know curled over. And again, I can feel that. If you were here, you could feel that. Um, and that's one thing that really gives us way as being a live oak, in addition to the unlobed leaves, no serrations or anything. But like the other oaks we've been talking about, has an alternate arrangement. Um, and these things have absurdly hard wood. This plant is really renowned for uh, making up some old historic warships that were incredibly durable. Uh, live oak wood is absurdly hard, but this is another cool native plant. You don't necessarily find it in this area, Here's the next plant we're going to be looking at. This one is, uh, I know I say it's about, about all of them, but this one's one of my favorites. This is Robinia pseudoacacia. Uh, so you can hear a specific epithet, pseudoacacia. It is similar to an acacia, uh, but the acacia genus, you know, it's its own genus, so the Robinia is uh, different. So this is another plant, similar to the Cersus we saw. It's in the Fabaceae family, the bean family. So it has flowers that sort of look like a uh, bean flower, like we talked about with that family in the family lecture. You can see the flowers are arranged along these racemes. These flowers are kind of old, they're a little senesced. Here we have some that are a little more uh, fresh. I think they have really pretty inflorescences when they're in bloom. This one, like I said, is kind of spent, so it's not as ornamental as it otherwise might be. Um, something else I want to point about this plant though, so these guys, I used as an example in the Fabaceae lecture about they have pointy structures on them. Actually, I misspoke in that lecture. So these structures, you see how they're in pairs, these come from stipules, which is um, technically associated with the leaf. So these would not be thorns, these would be considered spines. Um, but I just want to point out here is another pointy structure. 
Um, you gotta watch out for those when you're looking at this plant. But yeah, so it's got these compound leaves. So this is the compound leaf here. And like other things we talked about in the Fabaceae family, it has an alternate arrangement. And just to further reinforce it being in the bean family, here you can see a couple of fruits that have started to split open. They look like beans, because it's in the bean family. Yeah, Robinia, one of my favorites. Fixes nitrogen in its roots, like we talked about a lot of beans, so they can really fuel a lot of growth on their own. It's kind of a really weedy plant. I like this one a lot. Another great one for ecology. Um, the bees really like the flowers in this one. Anyways, I wish I saw more of these. Okay, and here we have Cayenanthus virginicus, the fringe tree. So Cayenanthus virginicus is a small shrub to a small tree, or, and it has these beautiful fringy white flowers um, and opposite foliage. So this here, this tree that I'm touching all these leaves on, this is the Cayenanthus. It has opposite leaf arrangement, and you can tell because the leaves attach here and there's buds at the base of each of the leaves, right? So that's how you tell if it's opposite or alternate. Now, the flowers themselves are pretty reduced and kind of small, um, so, and they don't last very long. This one's been blooming for a couple days and it's already starting to kind of fade. So the flowers have four petals and the inflorescences themselves are branched, so these are compound inflorescences. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the inflorescence structure is. I'll probably annotate it in the video though. And that's Cayenanthus virginicus, the French tree. So here we have the next plant we're going to be talking about, this sort of small tree. This is one of my favorites, although I've got to say most of these I feel like are some of my favorites. So this is Amalanc here, Arborea. Um, I mentioned this one a few times, I mentioned this one a little bit in the Rosaceae lecture. It has a few common names. Um, my favorite is Serviceberry. You often sometimes hear it as Shadglow as well, which I think is a pretty unflattering name. But it's got these leaves. Um, they're alternate leaves, uh, simple with little serrations. Um, here you can see the fruit, unfortunately miss the flowers, uh, but they have white flowers, um, five petals. Uh, but you can see the developing fruit. This is one I mentioned in the Rosaceae lecture. The fruits are very similar to blueberries. Um, so again, this is in the rose family, so it's more closely related to apples. So as I mentioned, um, these fruit, once they're mature, are a little similar to a blueberry. They're kind of dark blue and they superficially resemble a blueberry. But as I mentioned, them being in the Rosaceae family makes them closer related to a thing like an apple. And they kind of taste a little bit like an apple. I think as I mentioned in the Rosaceae lecture, um, I don't know, it's a really neat fruit, native, really common. I shouldn't say really common, but um, it's, a, it's a native edible fruit you can find. You can make it into a pie if you want. I just think that's a fun, neat plant. I think it's underutilized in the landscape. I wish I saw them a lot more in the landscape. They're great for wildlife. Um, Great for pollinators, good native plant. One of my favorites, like I said. So this small shrub here, or small medium-sized shrub here, there's a little bit of a hedge of them. Uh, this is Euonymus alatus. And that uh, specific epithet, alatus, often refers to a winged structure. So one of the common names for this plant is winged Euonymus. Another one is a uh, burning bush. These have really spectacular fall color. You'll notice these in the, in the fall, they have like bright crimson red, really absurdly red fall color. They really live up to the name Burning Bush. You can see these are actually in bloom currently. They have all these little yellow flowers on them with uh, four petals. Um, and these have opposite arrangement um, and simple leaves. And here, if you look at the stem up close, you can see the winged structures that give it its specific epithet or the common name, winged euonymus. And this plant is extremely invasive here in the southeastern U.S. So above me, we have a common landscaping plant that a lot of people may be familiar with. A really quintessential plant you often see draped over uh, water features like lakes maybe. This is Salix alba. Um, it's commonly referred to as a weeping willow. But just to point out, there's a few different species of Salix that you may see as a weeping willow in a landscape. Not all weeping willows are specifically this species, but this one is a Salix alba. Um, so as you can see, it has the kind of draped over um, pendulous twigs and branches that really hang down. And so these twigs, interestingly enough, actually have a lot of uh, rooting hormone in them, like naturally. Um, this is a plant, you could just stick it in water and it'll start growing out roots on its own. Um, you could, it, it's so rich in uh, rooting hormones, you could actually just put it in water and the hormone will seep into the water and then you can use that liquid as a rooting hormone in uh, you know, four other plants. 
So here you can see the foliage up close. You can see it's a few inches long, uh, pretty long and skinny. Um, here you can have a, here you can see another branch. Like I was talking about, it's got the thin, flimsy, pendulous twigs. You can see it has an alternate arrangement. And another fun fact about the salix plant is um, this is the plant that they originally got salicylic acid out of, which they used to create aspirin, the uh, you know, common medication. So here we have another oak that we're going to be looking at for today. So this oak is in the red oak group, which we'll talk about in a little more detail. Um, but red oaks, broadly speaking, have pointed lobes like you see here. This is a Quercus falcata. This specific one is a southern red oak. Um, and there's a few ways you can tell that. Um, so one way that I learned is that these lobes, compared to the northern red oak or Quercus rubra, these lobes tend to kind of swing out a little more than the other one you'll see. Um, so here you can see a leaf where the lobes sort of swing outward. Um, another thing is that the bottom of this one sort of looks like a bell a little bit in the way it's how, how it's rounded. And one way that I learned to remember that is it kind of looks like a bell, like a dress for like a southern bell, you know, southern red oak. Uh, that's in contrast to the Quercus rubra, the northern red oak that we'll be seeing in a moment. Um, but yeah, Quercus falcata, uh, southern red oak, another native tree to this area. You can find them commonly in the forest. Um, you know, lots of things love their acorns. Great native plant for the landscape. So here we have the Quercus falcata, the southern red oak leaves up close. You can see, as with the other oaks, it has the alternate arrangement. And one thing I want to point out with this family um, is sometimes the leaves can, or the, the species, leaves can change a lot depending on how much sun they get. So these leaves that you see here with all the lobes was grown in more light and this had more sun. And that's in contrast to a leaf like these here that kind of have more lobes and are kind of a broader leaf. I mean, fewer lobes. Um, the, sun, the sunny ones have a lot of long, skinnier lobes, whereas these are a little bit more of a simple leaf. And that can change depending on how much sun the individual leaf got. So both of those leaves came from this one plant. And they'll have that amount of variation within the same canopy, which can be a little confounding sometimes. So I want to point out that that is a, a very variability you'll see in this species. So this tree here, this next plant we're going to be talking about, here we have another oak. So another plant in the Quercus genus. This is a northern red oak, uh, Quercus rubra. This is another common plant you can find in our forest around here. So as with the other oaks we've seen, this has an alternate arrangement. It has a simple leaf, no compound leaves here. So there you can see the arrangement. But they do have lobed leaves as we've seen with some of the other oaks. And the way you can distinguish the plants in the red oak group is they have pointed lobes as you see here. And that's in contrast like we'll see with the white oak has rounded lobes. But we talked about the uh, Quercus falcata had the longer lobes that sort of curve off in a way. Whereas these are a little bit stockier. The whole leaf is a little bit blockier overall. And I talked about the uh, southern magnolia, uh, southern red oak, the Quercus falcata. I talked about that one, how it sort of has a bell-shaped base. It sort of makes me think of like southern bell. Um, so you can see these, they don't have that rounded base. They sort of have a cunate base. Um, and it doesn't quite have that bell shape that the uh, Quercus falcata did. So this is a Quercus rubra, northern red oak. Okay, so this is our next tree, Acer bergerianum. Acer bergerianum is also known as the trident maple. Uh, so this maple in particular is pretty neat. It's fairly common in the landscaping, I think. Um, I really, really love this tree. It's got these nice three-pronged leaves, like here, that you can see. Its leaf arrangement is opposite. Again, you can see the buds at the base of the, of the petioles there. And then, here we go. This one's actually in bloom. I'm gonna try to pull this entire branch down so I don't break it. And so these are the remnants of the bloom. So it's beginning to set fruit. And you can see the beginning of the, the winged seeds, the Samaras. And so there's two of them on each uh, flower there. And you can see this branched inflorescence with a whole bunch of remaining flowers. So that is Acer bergerianum, the trident maple. And you can see how that three lobe leaf gives it that trident common name. Yes. So this tree here is the next plant we're gonna be looking at. 
This is a maple in that Acer genus. This is a red maple, Acer rubrum. Uh, it gets that name because it has a whole bunch of red parts to it. Um, so right now, of course, leaves are green, but the petioles, where the leaf attaches to the stem, is usually red, depending on how much uh, sun it's in. If it's, in a, if it's a more shaded one, it can be more green. Um, the fruits and flowers are red in this plant. We don't have any now, unfortunately. The new growth, uh, the very new growth, is usually uh, red in the spring. Um, again, depending on how much sun it gets. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier in the semester, the red is from anthocyanins that works as sort of a plant sunscreen, is the way I think of it. It protects it from too much um, UV radiation. So uh, this is a maple. So like the other maples we've seen, they have opposite arrangement. You can see the twigs here are opposite of each other. And if you look at the leaves, the leaves are also opposite of one another. Sorry about the wind. So this is a little similar to the trident maple in that it has a three-lobed leaf. But the main way you tell it apart is that the Acer rubrum, red maple, have serrated leaves. And key is that they have serrations in the sinuses. They have serrations between the lobes. So that's kind of the main way you tell the red maple from the other maple. Um, but also the red petioles and the red structures also kind of can help with that. This is another native plant we find in the forest around here. It's extremely common, extremely common to the East Coast. You can find it um, from Florida to New York. Uh, they're really prevalent. Yeah, really common native plant. So here we have a magnolia, magnolia grandiflora with these big glossy leathery leaves. And you can see the big fuzzy buds on it. When we were talking about the magnolia ACE family, we talked about how they sometimes have these big fuzzy buds. So this would be a flower bud that in a few weeks or in a few days is gonna burst open to show that big massive white magnolia flower you may be familiar with. Oh, and here looking at the leaves, you can see it has this brown velvety backside something else indicates it being a magnolia grandiflora so you can see these have big simple unlobed leaves with a smooth margin and if you're able to see the arrangement these have an alternate arrangement um, and so there you can see the structures that would become the flowers but after they mature and get fertilized they become this fruit that we uh, saw a little bit earlier in the semester it's an aggregate of follicles uh, we saw this in the fruits lab um, this doesn't have any seeds in it currently they have those uh, big red seeds that sort of pop out and hang off. Um, but yeah, so that's the fruit you see in this species. And you can see what the foliage looks like. But yeah, it's a really big, massive tree, uh, common landscape plant in the southeast. You see lots of fragrances. So it has a smile like a magnolia. So this tree here. The next plant we're going to be talking about is another plant in the oak genus in our Quercus. This is uh, Quercus alba, Q alba, uh, the white oak. Um, so that specific epithet alba means white. That's something you might hear from time to time. So the white oak is another native plant to this area. You can find them um, populating our forests um, quite a bit. So they generally have kind of paler bark. It might be hard to tell here at a distance or just with this one specimen. But compared to the other oaks we've talked about, they have quite a bit paler bark. Also, it's generally a little bit flaky, um, kind of platy, like you see here. Um, and that's in contrast to the other oaks are often a little more vizured. So here I have a stem. You can see the arrangement, like all the other ones, all the other oaks we've seen. It's that alternate arrangement, leave here, leave here. So these are another one that's pinnately lobed, uh, like the red oak we saw, but these white oaks have rounded lobes, as opposed to the red oaks we talked about have pointed lobes. So that's the main way you tell a different plant. The main way you tell apart the white oaks versus red oaks is whether or not their lobes are rounded or pointed. But they're both uh, pinnately lobed like you see here. And the leaves can actually be quite variable depending on kind of the state of the tree. So these leaves I'm quoting came from a juvenile plant. Um, like with the southern red oak, the leaves in this species, if they're grown in shade, they can be much wider, much broader with uh, less defined lobes. Whereas the ones that are grown in the sun, we'll see an example of in just a moment, can be much more uh, lobed, much more deeply lobed. So here we can see an example of what I was just talking about. Uh, you can see the alternate leaves on the stem silhouetted against the sky. And these that are in a little bit more sun are a little more deeply lobed than the ones we saw a moment ago. And we have some other examples here that are 
less deeply lobed. They have uh, broader, less narrow leaves. So you can see there's some variation depending on how much sun we receive. So this tree here, this next plant we'll be talking about, this is a Betula nigra or a Betula nigra, um, either way. Uh, so this plant has a lot of ornamental value for its um, exfoliating bark, its papery bark, is uh, what it's often planted for in the landscape. And oftentimes you'll see them multi-trunk like you see with this one here. But that's done artificially um, by, you know, horticulturists in the nursery. Uh, naturally, they often just grow with one trunk. And this is another plant that's native to this area you can find growing in our forest. It's a little less common than the other ones we've seen, but they often grow in sort of wetter habitats naturally. But in the landscape, they can actually do really surprisingly well in drier areas as well. They're not limited just to wet environments. So here we have an example of the stem. So like with some other things we've seen, it has an alternate arrangement. Um, so this is a new growth. That's why there's leaves coming out looking like they're on pairs. But you can see the new growth is coming out in an alternate arrangement. Um, and this is another plant that has uh, unlobed leaves with a serrated margin. But uh, the bark, that peeling exfoliating bark is one of the main ways to distinguish it. And this one here has some reproductive structures on it as well. So here we have some female inflorescences that once these mature, these will break apart into many individual seeds. And here, additionally, we can see the male catkins that are starting to hiss to shed the pollen. Uh, when, when you're able to see them over the winter, they look like these kind of brown, smaller structures. But then in the spring, now, they burst open like you see here with this longer one. Oh, and uh, another characteristic of these plants is they have a sort of a deltoid, sort of a classic deltoid leaf shape with the corners over here and then down here too. This is Cornus Florida. Also, depending on who you ask, known as Benthamidia, Florida. Uh, this was one of uh, our quiz plants this year. Um, and this is in the Cornaceae family. So you can see it has these nice opposite leaves. They have arcuate veins. What that means is the veins go in arcs all along the edge of the leaf, all the way to the tip. You can kind of see that. These so these big white structures are actually bracts on these. These are actually inflorescences, not individual flowers. And so these white petals, petal-like structures are bracts, and the green parts in the middle are the individual flowers. So this one is spent. Uh, it is already flowered, and those individual flowers, all that's remaining is the style and the calyx of the petals, or sorry, calyx of the flower. And so. Eventually these will develop into fruit and you'll have these nice red berry-like structures. They're um, actually droops but they're in actually this case. Um, I was getting there. Um, and anyway, so this is Cornus Florida or Benthamidia Florida, depending on who you ask. Generally when you see it, it's usually a small tree. This one's particularly small. It's a, it's a, it's a young one, but even when it's in a maturity, this plant rarely gets more than 20 feet tall or so. So here's another oak that we're gonna be looking at. Um, this is a Quercus acutissima. This is a sawtooth oak. This is not a native species. This species is actually from Asia. Uh, and this plant can be quite invasive in forested areas. Um, they produce a huge amount of acorns. These are a really great plant for wildlife in some cases because they produce so much acorns. They're good for like attracting deer. But all those acorns, you know, lead to more sawtooth oaks. As I mentioned, these can actually be quite invasive. So here we have some of the leaves you can see up close. You can see how it gets the name, Sawtooth Oak. The leaves have little serrations. There's no lobes. They got these little bristles on them. And these little bristles on the tip is one way that I think of how to identify this species. Again, but no lobes. And again, like with the other oaks we've been seeing, they have the alternate arrangement that sometimes can be quite congested. But yeah, there you have the Quercus acutissima, Sawtooth Oak. Non-native, but produces a lot of acorns. So this shrub here, this is the next plant we're going to be looking at. You can see the white flowers on it. This is an Ilex vomitoria. The common name is Yopon holly. So that unflattering specific epithet, vomitoria, comes from some really neat natural history of this plant. 
Um, so this is a great native plant. This is a good one for the landscape. It's great for wildlife. Uh, birds like it and it has fruit on it that's good for wildlife. But this is a plant that was used in, um, by my understanding, a Native American purification ritual. Um, they would make a beverage from the plant that would be combined with other uh, unsavory items um, that would result in uh, throwing up you know, as part of the purification ritual. Um, and again, that led to this plant having that unflattering name, uh, specific epithet, Vomitoria. But this plant specifically, um, this is the only native plant in North America that has caffeine naturally occurring in it. Um, it's closely related to yerba mate, a plant you may be familiar with from uh, South America that is a popular Argentine beverage that's high in caffeine. So this would be a plant that you could harvest to you know, make a beverage from that has caffeine in that's good to drink. Um, and that'd be a good, you know, nice local beverage you could have to have on your global impact shipping coffee from around the world. And these plants have uh, separate male and female plants. You can see the little white flowers on it. This is a male plant. Um, it has the fertile anthers on it. <clears throat> you still might be able to see a small reduced gynecium in the middle, but that's uh, generally non-functional in these. The separate male and female plants. But yeah, you can see the alternate arrangement. They have evergreen leaves. And I think of these leaves as being a classic example of carnate margins. Yeah, Alex Vomitoria, another one of my favorites. Okay, so here we have Prunus caroliniana in the Rosaceae family. So as opposed to Prunus serotina, the trunk of this tree is typically much more smooth, and it doesn't have those rings of lenticels that I talked about earlier. Oh. Mark is getting a nice close-up of that here. I'll show you that bark is nice and smooth. Not so, quite as smooth as the Vegas or the beach. Yes. So this one is at the tail end of blooming, so I'm sure as I pull on it, all these flowers are gonna dump. Yep, just like that. Um, thank you, thank you, tree. So, just like the other prunus, the leaves are alternately arranged. So you can see these much smaller racines where these individual flowers are coming off of these small racines. And those green stem looking things are what's left of the racines after the flowers have fallen off. Um, so this plant sometimes will produce fruit, sometimes not, um, but the leaves themselves are alternately arranged, entire, with an acute or acuminate tip, and they're typically a real dark, glossy green, um, and this margin is entire. And fun thing about Prunus caroliniana is that if you scratch the bark off at the tip of the new growth, and you sniff it, it smells like maraschino cherries. Um, as opposed to the black cherry, which smells like cyanide, um, which is not great. So this one smells really good. Black cherries smell really bad. So yeah, Prunus caroliniana in the Rosaceae family, also known as the Carolina cherry laurel. This is Vaccinium corymbosum, also known as the highbush blueberry. It's a small to medium-sized shrub, and as you can see, it has leaves and fruit on this one currently. It is alternately arranged. Let's see, there we go. You can see the alternate arrangement there and the spent flower is beginning to develop into fruit. But in particular, uh, this particular vaccinium or highbush blueberry has these really nice white ursulate flowers. So the fruit you can see is inferior to the rest of the flowers. So you see the fruit developing here and you see the five, sorry, this is so washed out. Um, see those five to six little uh, star-shaped sepals attached to the ovary? That, and you might be familiar with those if you purchase blueberries at the store. Um, and worth noting, um, vaccinium in general have green stems, especially on newer growth. And even on some of the slightly older growth, you can see it still maintains some of that greenness. Um, so this is just going to be the first of many native species that we're about to go through. So this is Asculus sylvatica in the Sapindaceae, also known as buckeye. This is one of a few different species of buckeye that are native around here. You can see the large palmately compound leaves and the opposite leaf arrangement here. There's another one that's opposite. You can see that they are opposite. 
There we go. All right. And so here are some of the flowers. So these flowers are kind of fabaceous looking, but it is not in fabaceae. Um, these are probably moth pollinated based off of their yellow coloration, but they could potentially be hummingbird pollinated. There are a number of hummingbird pollinated species within this family and within this particular genus. As you can see, this is a small shrub or tree, um, and it's a really nice plant in the landscape. This is a Sarum canadensis, also known as wild ginger. Um, you can see these herbaceous kind of soft leaves. This is as opposed to Hexastylus uh, aerifolia, the other common plant around here known as wild ginger. The main way to tell them apart is these leaves are much more kind of flimsy, herbaceous, whereas Hexastylus is leathery. And the cool thing about these is the flowers themselves are usually beneath the leaf litter. So that is the flower right there. You can see that these have, they're pretty fuzzy, and inside you can see those stamens and the gynecium. And that's it, the Serum Canadensis. This is Hexastylus aerifolia, also known as wild ginger. Um, this is a different ginger than the Acerum canadensis, and you can tell especially by the small flowers. So these kind of tube, sorry about this video, these kind of tube-like structures here are the flowers. You can see they're not as open as the Acerum was. In fact, they're almost entirely closed. So this plant is also known as Little Brown Jug, which is a kind of odd common name, but the reason these are called wild gingers is because if you pick the leaves and crush the leaves in the stems, the closer to the root, the more it smells. Um, and it smells very similar to ginger, but it is not the ginger that you cook with. So this uh, pretty yellow daisy looking flower is Pacara aurea, has a common name, I'm flattering, common name of ragwort. It's in the Asteraceae family, the sunflower family. Um, it has these sort of fluffy seeds here, which you can see help disperse it. It can be a little weedy in some areas, but this is a native plant that we have around here. And you can identify it, distinguish it from the other Pacara we'll be looking at. Because this one has uh, entire, um, or it has simple basil leaves, whereas the other one has uh, much more compound leaves. Here we have another plant in the Asteraceae family. Um, it's another plant in the Pacara genus. This is Pacara glabella has the common name butterweed. And the main way you can tell it apart from the other Pacara we look at, this one is much larger overall. It has much more robust stems, whereas the Pacara aurea has much smaller stems. But uh, primarily, this one has mostly dissect leaves, uh, much more lobed and much more incised leaves to the point of them being dissect, whereas, or uh, compound. Um, whereas the other one, as I mentioned, had uh, much more entire simple leaves. So this is Tradescantia hirsutocollis, the hairy stem spiderwort. It is in the Comilinaceae family, um, and as you can see on the stems, it's quite hairy. So aptly named. Um, the flowers are made up of three petals. Uh, usually they have kind of fuzzy stamens. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it here. Kind of see it there a little bit. But then as we zoom out uh, and show you kind of this bed here, you can see there's quite a few of them, um, but in particular, there are many that have very different colors. So you can see these dark purple ones and the pink ones I just showed you. So they can be really variable in the wild. This plant is a Rubus trivialis. It's in the Rosaceae family, the rose family. You can see it has alternately arranged trifoliate leaves. They're compound leaves with three leaflets, alternate arrangement. Um, so this plant has little spines on it. Uh, not spines or either thorns or prickles. Um, and you can see it has a pretty classic example of a rose family flower here, sort of a broad, broad open flower um, for a generalist and fluorescent, a generalist pollinator, many stamens. Yeah, and so these produce a fruit that is uh, similar to something like a raspberry or a blackberry. This is Trillium maculatum, the spotted trillium. Trilliums are in the Melanthiaceae family. Uh, Trillium maculatum is named for its spotted leaves. You can see that kind of modeling. Unfortunately, these two leaves have been a little bit damaged. Um, you can see these beautiful red petals coming up and these dark red anthers inside. 
So these form uh, small fleshy berries. Uh, they're three loculed typically. Um, and to show you a few examples of the beautiful foliage that they can have. So like I said, they're spring ephemerals. They come up in the spring, bloom, produce their fruit, and then uh, dehisce and come up again the next year. So this plant here is a Thelictrum thelictroides. It's a really small uh, ephemeral plant um, that grows in the woodlands around here. Uh, these are actually fairly common. Uh, if you see one, you're likely to see a whole bunch of them. And here you can see the fruit on them developing, the developing ovaries. So yeah, cute little plant, has a common name windflower or rue anemone. Um, really fine, really small woodland plant you can find. This is Trillium luteum, also known as the yellow trillium or yellow wake robin. So the way you can tell this apart from some of the other yellow flowering trilliums is that both the petals and, it's kind of hard to see here, the stamens are also yellow. There we go. So the stamens and the petals are yellow on this one. So if it doesn't have both yellow and, or yellow stamens and petals, it is not Trillium luteum, but this one is. Also, they can sometimes have the modeling on the leaves. Um, you can see it's kind of lightly modeled there, but uh, they don't always have to have that. This is one of my favorite plants, Aracema triphyllum, also known as Jack in the Pulpit. It is in Araceae, so the Arum family. So you can see the leaves have uh, a single stem coming up to three leaflets. So the triphylum name is a little bit of a misnomer in that those are leaflets, not leaves. But then the flowers themselves are really cool, or sorry, inflorescences themselves are really neat. So you can see that spathe and spadix flower with the spadix coming out the top and that really cool hood. Oftentimes they'll be kind of purplish colored, um, but they are currently kind of under attack from a fungus that has been, causes the growth to contort and the flowers and inflorescences actually kind of end up aborting if they get infected with it. So uh, if you see one, don't transplant it, don't do anything with it. Try not to touch them too much um, because you can spread that pathogen. This little beauty is Trillium catesbii. Trillium catesbii has a small nodding flower like this. It is uh, uh, nodding beneath the leaves themselves. As you can see, those three leaves, and then beneath it you have this pink or white petaled flower with bright yellow stamens. This is the nodding wake robin. And actually, I misspoke. These are actually leaflets, so this is one single leaf. But the flowers are subtended by three calyx, or three sepals, and you can see the superior ovary with the stigma in the middle there. So this plant right here, this kilo flower, this is an iris cristata, has a common name dwarf iris. This is a native, another native understory plant, grows in shade areas, has rhizomes, um, and it can form big banks, big, big beds of it naturally forming. So this plant here with these purplish flowers, this is Phlox divericata. The common name is purple phlox. It has these, uh, Corum inflorescences with these five petal flowers on them. And if you look at the stem here, you can see they have opposite leaves and kind of fuzzy leaves and fuzzy stems. Uh, so that's the Phlox divericata. And you can see these Phlox plants are growing in amongst a bed. Uh, all these leaves down here, this is that Iris cristata, the dwarf iris. Um, so I just want to show you an example of what that looks like when it grows in a big bed, like I mentioned. Um, unfortunately, these aren't flowering. Except right here. Oh, yeah, except for... <laughs> so yeah, there you can see what they look like. So this is Podophyllum peltatum, also known as Mayapple. It's in the Berberidaceae family. And when they're immature, you'll see them put up a single kind of umbrella-shaped leaf like this one here. And it's attached to a stem that is at or below ground level. As they mature, they, they put up what I believe is a single leaf, but I could be incorrect about that. And a flower is born at the joint between the two leaves. So this is a really nice radial flower. You can see the stamens, the superior ovary, and it's you can see where it's attached at the base of these two leaves. It's colonial, it pops up in the spring, blooms. Uh, the fruit is not edible for humans. It's actually poisonous. 
Um, it's also known as maypops, um, but it's a very, very cool spring ephemeral plant. So this plant here is a Chrysogonum virginianum. As you might be able to tell from these flowers, it's in the Asteraceae family, the sunflower family. Um, this one's actually a low growing ground cover. You often sort of find it in uh, shaded understory habitats, wooden habitats around here. You can see we have a really large bank of it here. But it has this sort of opposite leaf, vining, growing habit. Like I said, it sort of mats and makes a ground cover. So here we have a Styloforum diphyllum. Uh, common name is the wood poppy. You can see it has these dissected lobe leaves. And it's not flowering, but here we have the fruit on it. They kind of look like some other poppy fruit you might see, uh, but these are quite fuzzy. This would be a dehiscent capsule that will split open to spill the seeds. This is another native perennial you can find in our woodlands around here. So this plant here is the next plant we'll be talking about. I think it has a fun scientific name. Uh, it's Uvularia perfoliata. You can see that specific epithet comes from the, uh, it has perfoliate leaves. Uh, the stem goes directly through all of the leaves, as well as you can see the flowers bloomed through the leaves. Here we have the fruit, um, the maturing ovary, but uh, Uvularia perfoliata. They have a yellow sort of pendulous flower here. But again, I just think it has a fun, fun name. Good example of the perfoliate leaves. This is Hydrastis canadensis, also known as golden seal. As you can see, uh, this mature specimen has a small fruit right here, or what's left of the flower actually. This is in the Ranunculaceae family. And similar to the mayapple that I showed you earlier, you can see this has a single stem coming up and it splits into what appear to be two leaves, with the flower, in this case, coming out from one of the two leaves. Although these may be leaflets, we're not entirely sure. Um, the immature plants do have a single leaf from a single stem. Here we have another spring ephemeral. This one has a name that I uh, really like to say. It's in the genus Zephyranthes. It's Zephyranthes adamasco. It has a common name, adamasco lily, or more commonly, rain lily. It's in the Amaryllidaceae family, and you can see it portrays the characteristics of that family really well. It has the six tepals and then the basal leaves. Uh, so this is a plant you can actually find in garden centers sometimes to plant as a bulb to have, you know, in a native garden. Um, so, you know, it's a good plant to have here in the landscape. This is Geranium maculatum in the Geraniaceae family. So Geranium maculatum is a native geranium with bright pink to purple petals and the stamens are numerous and often have yellow or even purple pollen. Um, you can see the deeply dissected leaves emerging with hairy stems from the ground. And again, this is another spring ephemeral.